This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube and wish to listen to this program as a podcast, you may click the link below to your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with James Shapiro, professor in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. Jim serves on the board of directors of the Royal Shakespeare Company, and in 2011 was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. We will begin our talk today with his recent book entitled Shakespeare in a Divided America. This series is funded with institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Well, Jim, there you are. Then thank you so much. And thank My you pleasure. so much for, for joining us. My colleagues in Japan, here in Japan, internationally, in theater, literary, liter uh, linguistic, cultural studies, uh, just people who are interested in Shakespeare and, and also things American in this case, um, they're all going to be super grateful. And we, of course, are asking many non-Americans to give us leeway to talk about things American. You and I are both Americans, both from uh, very different backgrounds, actually, but both sons of the Republic and the great American experiment. When I first saw the title, Shakespeare in a Divided America, I thought, oh, no, James Shapiro has jumped into the whole Trump thing, social media, cable news, hornet's nest with Shakespeare in hand. And I was really relieved to see the subtitle concerning our past and our future. And there's a bit of that stuff at the end, and rightfully so, but I was pleased to find that it started with John Quincy Adams, one of the heroes of the Armistad. But then I was disheartened as it continued with the paradox present within his soul concerning Othello and race. So my relief was short-lived. And when I was reminded via Shakespeare that division has been with us as Americans since the beginning. And the very Shakespearean poetic element of paradox also I kind of want to ask you about. Uh, you show how Shakespeare at once reflects conflicts in American consciousness, but has also, also driven the minds of American influencers, including presidents and a notable assassin. May we ask you to give us an overview of your book? Sure. I should say that those, uh, including yourself, familiar with my work, know that I have focused, at least for the previous quarter century, on two years in Shakespeare's life and in Elizabethan and Jacobean in England. And I thought the furthest afield I would ever get from Elizabethan England was Jacobean England. I'd, I'd, I'd go as far as 1606, but that's as far as I would really trespass. No, the year and, of Lear, yeah. Yes, yes. yeah. Um, and those two books took me, the first one took 15 years to research and write. And the internet made it a little faster. So the year of Lear just took me a decade to, to research and, and to write. So had you asked me back when I was researching and writing those books, would you write about Shakespeare in America? My answer would be in all honesty, I know precious little about America and um, Shakespeareans tend not to write about America. They tend to write about the Anglo-American context. If it's global, they would look to Japan before they'd write about America. My first publication uh, for Shakespeare Quarterly, and the only time I published in that extraordinary journal was a short piece on Hamlet in Tokyo. So that's as far afield as I would get. But in 2016, when Hillary Clinton was defeated and Donald Trump was elected president, I, I realized I, I, I didn't really understand what was going on in my own country and that I had a much better sense of what was going on in 1599 than in 2016. And a few years before this, I had put together an anthology for the Library of America on Shakespeare in America. And that gave me a stepping stone to start thinking about what was going on in America through the only focusing lens I know, which is Shakespeare. And it may not be the best focusing lens, 
but it's the only one uh, I know. And it meant um, touring a bit, going to the South, which uh, uh, I've lectured in the South, but serious visits to Tennessee and Florida and Texas and a couple of other states, just to try to understand how Shakespeare uh, was understood there and was valued there. And then I just do what I usually do, which is go into archives and thought hard about an arc that began, as you say, with the founding fathers and took us up to uh, the year of publication. And I, I didn't want to write a, a survey, uh, a really wonderful survey of Shakespeare in America it was published by Alden and Virginia Vaughan, who are friends, and I admire that book enormously. I, I wanted to do what I ordinarily do in my work, which is choose a year or choose a series of years and then drill down and see if I could really understand a specific historical moment and how a particular Shakespeare production or adaptation or uh, conflict uh, might help explain something about America's past so that I could see where we came from. And again, as you rightly noted, where we might be heading because that is as crucial, although more difficult to speculate about but I thought if I, I established a, a trajectory that took me from the 1830s to 2017, I might be able to say something about where we are heading. Yeah, uh, well, I, I was struck right off the bat uh, with the idea of J.Q. Adams uh, being so ardently against interracial marriage and, and taking it out on the play. Uh, which, of course, even in his time was a, a, a kind of ancient play, but he he took it as contemporary, as personal. And then we're, we're transported into Corpus Christi, Texas, uh, with <laughs> Ulysses S. Grant and Drag playing Desdemona. <laughs> and, I, and I didn't know this. I've read a little on this subject, but I didn't know these things. Uh, and it were enlightening. I, I certainly didn't know them when I began. I, I, I revere John Quincy Adams as a fierce abolitionist, sixth president of the United States, a man who went back into the House of Representatives to fight slavery after he left the presidency. So I have enormous respect for him and always have and still do. And yet he exemplified something that I discovered again and again in researching and, and, and writing Shakespeare in a divided America, which is there are things people will say about Shakespeare or through Shakespeare that they won't say in any other way. So John Quincy Adams has left a record of tens of thousands of pages of diaries and other kinds of writings. And he nowhere in them mentions miscegenation or as he would have called it amalgamation. The only time he did so was on in two essays on Othello. And I realized that there's a, a kind of unwritten history of America that can be unpacked if you look at what people say about Shakespeare or live through Shakespeare. You gave, you gave the example of Ulysses S. Grant uh, as a member of the, the 4,000 strong U.S. Army about to invade Mexico and extend the reach of slavery. And, and there he is rehearsing the role of Desdemona. And if you ask me what my kind of takeaway on that is, I think it's extraordinary that a man who led the, the Union forces uh, uh, not that long after in, in the Civil War, who would become president himself, saw the world through the eyes of a woman. He's wearing a dress uh, and, and Longstreet, his, his foe in the Civil War said, he, he looked really good in a dress. Um, <laughs> Grant saw the world through the eyes of a woman in love with a black man. And I think that is a great thing for a United States president to, to do, any United States president. Yeah, yeah, to transport himself into that world but the interesting thing also that you remark upon is the choice of Othello in this uh, basically uh, 
expansionism that include that included slavery and expansion uh, and, uh, and expansionism that was trying to expand slavery into what now is Texas proper and that this would be the play of choice in some way you know we in in the academic world right now the preoccupations rightly so are about race but when Grant and his fellow officers put on Othello, I'm sure they were thinking of this as a play about military culture and military life. Yeah. And there are many, many, many Americans who serve in the military who will understand the issues that Iago struggles with of promotion, of being passed over. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think race mattered less to these soldiers than an army play. And Othello is an army play. There's, there's no question about that. And the question comes up right off the bat among my uh, peers sometimes of what is, uh, why Shakespeare in America? Now, my answer has been, well, you know, if you read any history of the 13 colonies, and as I have, um, I'm from South Carolina, I've read uh, history, they're fascinating, all of them. And, but you're disappointed at the beginning to find out you, you have to go through a hundred to 150 pages worth of what happened before the, you know, 1776 and all of this stuff. And it has to do with indigenous peoples, native tribes, the relationship between colonists who were subjects of the crown. And so it's, it's perfectly natural that they, they view themselves as English and reading Shakespeare uh, as well as Milton or the Bible or uh, anything would have been very strongly ingrained before even the uh, revolution. So it doesn't seem to me that curious that Shakespeare uh, you know, just be became part of the American experience. I agree. And, and I think about the ways in which Shakespeare's poetry is written at the same time that the King James Bible that so shaped the language and, and rhetoric uh, and belief systems uh, of so many Americans in the 17th and 18th centuries, early colonization. So it, it, it's no surprise until you get to post 1776, when it looks like America will want to find its own literary heroes rather than except those uh, handed down from uh, the nation they've broken with. And that turns out not to be the case uh, to Melville's chagrin, probably to many others. Um, Shakespeare remains, you know, I didn't know this when I began the book, but he's the only author in the common core that is specified as someone who sh whose work should be taught to high school students in America today. And his works are taught to 90% or so of American high school students. So reports of his death are greatly exaggerated. <laughs> well, it's also very good stuff, uh, let's, let's admit. But uh, and um, I think in the States, it was kind of slow to develop a literary tradition that was, was received well in, in the States. In fact, if my memory serves, uh, some of the great writers, uh, uh, Longfellow and Whitman, first enjoyed receptions in France or in England, and then the Americans found out, oh, we we have our own people too. Uh, so, uh, it, but it was it was a slow in coming. Uh, what was not slow in coming was a sense of partisan nationalism that, uh, in your book, culminates. It probably was there before and. Well, I'm sure it was there before, but in the Astor Place riots. And I, I do remember an old book now, and I wish I could remember the author, but it was issued by the Folger Library called Shakespeare in America. And I came across it years ago, and I read that about that incident for the first time. And I'm going, I want to know so much more about this. And you told us so much more about it. It was a, it was a fun story to tell. Uh, I, one of the challenges in writing this book was each episode that I wrote about, especially uh, Astor Place and uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln and his assassin, John Wilkes Booth, they wanted to be books. And every day I'd go to the computer and fight and trim and cut because uh, I needed to contain multitudes in this book and it couldn't swell out of shape. Mm 
But the Astor Place riots in my native New York continue to haunt me. Um, my students are, are really engaged by it, whether it's about income inequality, nationalism, class conflict, uh, immigration, uh, maybe even a bit of racism thrown into the mix. It's, it's a hard story to untangle. Uh, and yet it's the first time blood is shed over Shakespeare in, in, in a serious way in the world. And 20 people were killed, a couple of hundred were injured over a production of Macbeth, if you can imagine that. Yeah. Uh, out of airy nothing, I think, and uh, the prince says in Romeo and Juliet that, you know, here, when it gets started, how quickly people can become unhinged in a mob situation. And of course, in a time in New York City, when you didn't have, I don't think you had a professional trained constabulary. Uh, I think they had to bring in the National Guard with their rifles to to start shooting into the crowd. It, it they did. Bad. They brought in the, the state militia. And in fact, you're right. One of the results of the Astor Place riots was the establishment of the New York police force. Uh, the NYPD okay. came know. out of that. And also the creation of Central Park because civic leaders understood there's too much pressure building up in this urban environment. We need to give people a release and uh, a night at the theater is insufficient in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm thinking it may be later when you have the uh, scenes that we remember as Daniel Day-Lewis from Gangs of New York yes. and the, uh, the Boys of the Bowery and those tough guys coming in from their uh, uh, meat butchering shops or whatnot from uh, who also went to theater. And I, yes, they did. Uh, yeah. Not much that, not much later than this, in fact. And yeah. uh, that's part of the the roiling gangs and divisions between communities in downtown Manhattan in, in the 19th century. Lots of rioting. Yeah. Well, I, I, I was uh, very, really impressed. Well, let's, let's pause a little bit with Lincoln, because that connection with the Booth uh, family and uh, that how they were in themselves, even before the assassination part of a large part of American theater history. Uh, and from what I know, uh, the father was Ed, Edwin Booth. Is that right? Father was Junius. Junius Edwin Brutus. Was the Junius brother. Brutus Booth. What yes. a name. Junius Brutus Booth. Edwin Brut Booth was the brother. And this conflict had to do with bringing Macready over, a famous British actor, uh, who wasn't, you know, he wasn't a member of the House of Lords. He was a regular guy uh, who had his own class struggles in England, I think, you know, like any actor did at that time. But he was uh, famous enough to go on the great American tour that I, I think that uh, people don't know about, that this may begin in New York, but it goes to D.C., it goes to Nashville and uh, maybe St. Louis. There's a theater in Charleston, South Carolina, certainly New Orleans, but they would tour America and gain uh, traction and fame. And he was competing against Forrest, uh, who was the, his American counterpart, uh, who would have been like, I, I don't know if you talk about two Olivier's or two, you know, and uh, they, 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 they took this competition, something like your uh, British um, hooligans, you know, in terms of, you know, which team you're on. It's, you know, we forget a lot of our cultural history in America. The superstar performers in the 19th century were Shakespeare actors, Charlotte Cushman, uh, and uh, imported heroes uh, like McCready. <clears throat> Edwin Forrest is, is the first great American male Shakespearean. And every small, mid-sized and large town and city in America had theaters and they would go from theater to theater. And when McCready went to Cincinnati, somebody threw half of a sheep's carcass on stage <laughs> to protest his performance. There you go. You know, uh, forget these polite crowds, you know, who exactly and, uh, this was raucous stuff. And there was theater within theater, uh, Absolutely. you know, the, the observation you see it in Hamlet. But then later where who's there in society? And this is 
this is we're getting into Edith Wharton's New York. You know, there's high society. There are people in the in the book of high society who are approved, and they have their uh, various uh, places along the side and their privileged seats. And then you have the pit down there with all these people and a lot of people observing how someone else reacts to a particular scene. That kind of uh, stuff going on. It just must have been something. It was more like a prize fight than, you know, we think of <laughs> theater where people politely applaud at the end. Uh, if you applaud in the middle of it, people give you a dirty look. People are throwing pennies and oranges and rotten fruit and uh, there's prostitution going on in the upper level. I mean, it was a three ring circus. That's what theater was in the 19th century. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also uh, in Covent Garden, in uh, what now? Absolutely. West, yes. West, West End. Uh, and uh, that kind of stuff. And these actors, some of them, I'm trying to remember if it was, uh, I don't know if it was Keen, but there was one actor who famously would just play Lear drunk uh, in one of the things I read. And there are things you had to leave out. I'm, I imagine that you probably feel that you had to leave out 90%. Uh, there's a, a situation where a sentry shoots Othello uh, yeah, because he gets so involved in the play. And I can't remember the source, but they're just story after story of things that just are amazing that happen during these performances. Well, one of the one of the pleasures of my life is when I'm not teaching uh, Shakespeare at Columbia, I'm working with the public theater, either in summer productions at the Delacorte in Central Park. But more often than that, taking professional actors on tour with 90 minute versions of the plays to prisons and uh, halfway houses around New York. And the first time I went to Rikers prison, uh, they didn't know they were supposed to sit on their hands and, and clap politely. And we were doing much ado and hero faints and six guys jump up. She's down, she's down. And, uh, and much else besides uh, going to the women's prison in Westchester when Romeo doesn't avenge himself on Tybalt. He was getting some nasty stuff thrown his way. When he came back and killed Tybalt, it was to universal relief in this crowd. So I, I love, I love prison Shakespeare because it's much closer to an Elizabethan and 19th century experience than it is to our overly polite modern day theater. Yeah, I, when I was in graduate school, I had the experience of teaching in uh, maximum security pr uh, prison. Oof. And, uh, and well, I, I didn't do it long because it was, uh, uh, afterwards, I would be uh, drained in uh, the uh, sense of, uh, because these were smart people and, uh, they had passed tests to take a college level class and I uh, was a grad student and I did the, the waste of resources of human resources that I felt and also a strong uh, the, the, well I came away with two things that the number one there are people in prison who don't need to be there and number two there are some people who do you, we're we're happy that they are there uh which prison was this uh this was Kirkland Correctional Institute in Columbia South Carolina so we're uh and it's uh, heavy duty heavy duty and pr primarily African-American, you know, part of that history of, well, let's, let's see if we can somehow detain African-American men somehow. Uh, and uh, yet there were two uh, young white guys in there about 19 years old, and both were in due to these uh, idiotic legislative moves, not just in South Carolina, but in other states to supersede judges and, and their judgment. So it was a three strikes and you, you're out. And I checked the records. I had someone who was a friend in the uh, office and checked the records. Uh, two bus for marijuana and one bus for small amounts of cocaine, but enough to get them 20 years locked down, no parole. And those wow. two boys, those two boys were in there. And there was a, a gentleman in there who looked, I swear, just like Morgan Friedman in Shawshank. And, and same kind of personality, like he goes, I'm not sure what I would do if I got out now. But he was he killed he killed a man uh, yeah. tw 25 years earlier, uh, drunk, maybe on drugs in a bar fight. Uh, and he said, you know, if I had lost, he would be here and I'd be in the ground. Uh, but I saw no reason to, you know, have have him detained. He was a, a mild, peaceful soul, as were several other people there. But you know, I when, think, when I think about prison, 
uh, inmates, Shakespeare's plays are filled with murder, with violence, with a lot of unspeakable things that you and I in our daily lives don't have much contact with. Yeah. Broken families, the whole nature of so many of these plays. And one of the most rewarding things is bringing plays to audiences that know from experience what these plays are about. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, I think I was attracted to that, but from uh, Jean Genet, I uh, was kind of famous for his prison performances. And early when I was uh, when I was in college, I studied. Uh, I did a foreign study at University of London, and just took in, uh, you know, a country boy finally getting into the West End. And every every day, you could do a matinee and an even evening performance. You can get these cheap tickets, you know, you, and it's just this infectious thing. You know, you you fall in love with it so immediately. And uh, one of the productions I saw was the San Quentin Players. Uh, oh, great. Dire directed by uh, Beckett himself in a burned out kind of theater. Wow. Uh, Tottenham Court Road. And wow. I, I never will forget that production. I've never seen Beckett. I've seen the uh, end game uh, maybe two times before that. And it was done in a, a jocular fashion. You can do it that way. Uh, but the pain that was transferred from those actors to the audience, it, that was, uh, it was so dark, but it was so good. Well, you're very lucky to have seen that in the yeah. San Quentin experiment in, 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 in Shakespeare and in Beckett uh, is unmatched, really. It's yeah. extraordinary. Yeah, and that he managed to do that. That's just amazing uh, that uh, that would happen. And uh, but let's uh, move on a little bit. I want to go up to Henry Cabot Lodge. He kind of in interests me on the subject of paradox, uh, someone who at once was pro-immigration, then turned strongly against it, had Shakespearean justifications, it seems, from the Tempest or whatnot, uh, similar to uh, uh, John Quincy Adams, who had his reasons to support abolition, but then very privately uh, felt that wh white people and black people should not uh, procreate. Uh, so uh, that, uh, that paradox, which is in Shakespearean sonnets or whatever, playing with that notion, but Henry Cabot Lodge and a brilliant man uh, in his writing. These right? are extraordinary intellects. And one of the things that I didn't want to do was write a book in which all the heroes were northerners and all the villains from the south a kind of mason dixon or east west divide or even liberal and conservative because uh, john quincy adams was by anybody's standards of the day on the liberal end of the spectrum so it's not as if i was going after any individual or group in this what i was trying to say was that individuals gravitate to shakespeare for different reasons uh and uh, Lodge, one of the towering intellects in the Senate at the turn of the century, decided to make immigration his issue. And he used Shakespeare as a stick to beat immigration with. And he was relentless. And uh, the result was the 1924 restrictions on immigration in this country, only, only overturned in the 1960s. And Right now, we're in the midst of a crisis over immigration. So none of these issues go away. Mm -hmm. And Shakespeare again and again is mobilized, sometimes weaponized by the left and the right yeah. in dealing with the things that Americans are really not good at talking to each other about and of working through communally and collectively. Yeah. Yeah, as I, you know, get older and look back over the uh, Jim Crow South that I grew up in, it was still that way. Uh, but then uh, schools were desegregated and uh, things that there wasn't the type of violence or fighting that you would imagine because we were kids. You know, this, this was our time in that school, and we knew we had to mediate these conflicts. There were friendships uh, that, that, that were limited because of the uh, uh, continuing inability for anyone to go to anybody else's home uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, I've always thought, you know, if you if you pass a, a if you had a Geiger counter, a, race, a racist Geiger counter, and passed it over America, there there probably would be upticks. Maybe even now, you know, in, in the South. Uh, it might be surprising, uh, it might be very high, it might not be that high at all, but anywhere you passed it over, and in recent uh, uh, history, you know, the problems with uh, policemen not, uh, shooting, 
shooting kids or whatnot or arresting for no no reason. These are happening all over the country. Right. And I live in New York City, one of the the liberal bastions of this country. And our Department of Education is among the most segregated in the country, hands down. So these issues, and again, the Shakespearean connections to these issues uh, run throughout the whole country. It's it's not one community or another. It's not high culture or low culture. It's Shakespeare on film. It's Shakespeare in musicals. everywhere we turn, we watch as people try to confront and resolve differences really through Shakespeare, which I find thrilling. Well, uh, The Tempest, and getting back to Henry Cabot Lodge and that movement to to appropriate The Tempest, uh, recently, I think it was in Arizona, The Tempest, or there was a move to ban it from education because some of our colleagues in post-colonial studies found it uh, a play to use to enlighten people to the um, ideas of post-colonial thinking and uh, very progressive uh, left thinking. And it was used for the opposite reason during that time, that the same play uh, was used to to do two different things quite different on the political spectrum. That's what I love about Shakespeare, that a play that's now taught as the um, anti-colonial or exposing colonialism, Tempest, uh, was in 1916 in the midst of these battles over immigration used to, as as a means of encouraging the education and assimilation of the immigrants who are streaming into America. So uh, the history of productions is um, endlessly, to me, endlessly fascinating. And um, I'm, I'm still working on these issues, even having published that book. Yeah. And the introduction, not only of white superiority against uh, slaves or freed slaves or blacks, uh, then you add, uh, there's a whole smorgasbord that would be Italian immigrants from Southern Italy, as you pointed out, and, uh, uh, and any other kinds of Eastern European. And my immigrants. unwashed ancestors from Eastern Europe, Jews. Well, born and into the anti-Semitism, anti- which is a strong theme in your writing and other books, you, uh, you steer straight into that. And uh, I remember years ago reading your, uh, we, we might get to this uh, in a bit, but uh, reading your- Shakespeare your, and the Jews. Yeah, yeah. And uh, your apologia at the very beginning saying, I just did not want to go into this. And it reminded me a little bit of uh, Hector and uh, Troilus and Cressida. There are all of these reasons not to go into it. Okay, yeah. so here, here I go. <laughs> and let's just do it. It, it needs to be done. And uh, well, uh, moving up to uh, the uh, shrew and the, Shrew is very recently back, you know, very strong. People want to do it because it's it's a great play and it has some great things in it. But the the way of uh, t- for you know Kate to manage the ending in the speech and and that sort of and whether or not kiss me Kate whether uh, sh- there is a kiss or not a kiss that sort of thing with Shakespeareans and production. There's a recent uh, virtual reality version of it that I interviewed. David McGinnis and another guy named Steve Wittick at Carnegie Mellon, and they put together, Steve Wittick uh, had the technology to do a kind of 360 virtual reality version, which is very interesting, but then handling what we hope is post uh, uh, sexist, it isn't, but uh, you know, what we're hope we're aiming to. And then those issues were there and uh, in, you know, post a war America, that's when that's that's the rub, isn't it? Uh, getting back, and those women have been working in factories. They know they can work. They know they can bring home a paycheck. And to suddenly surrender all of that to these guys coming back from the war, that... One day you're told, be Rosie the Riveter. And the next day you're told, be a submissive wife and quit your job so uh, a veteran coming home from the war can have it. And that was the great background to Kiss Me Kate. And um, uh, it was just fun delving into that moment uh, of mid-century history that, again, I knew precious little about. And looking at the ways in which Bella Spiewak, who wrote the book for this extraordinary musical, uh, was herself struggling with these issues in her personal life. So 
I don't think I've ever had as much fun researching a book because there was so much I did not know. And throwing myself into these stories was, uh, was great fun, like rolling around in the snow like a kid. Well, I'm going to move a little bit more quickly and get up to the um, uh, LGBTQ uh, a bit and how you integrated that with the, uh, the uh, vexing issue of how to change the ending of Shakespeare in love. And uh, I just... <laughs> I got a little bit, you say tongue tied, a little brain tied on that. I mean, that was a big, and Harvey Weinstein, there he is, you know, and you know, just you can't make it up. Yeah. From behind the curtain, there's always a Harvey Weinstein somewhere back there. And uh, the uh, Tom Stopper trying to work with this uh, script that had been written years before, and it was not historically accurate, but that uh, had these elements of uh, homoeroticism, right? And I, I remember when I saw it the first time, just thinking, this is just delightful. It's very Shakespearean and it's wonderfully adapted. But they had to tweak it to become the mega hit that it became. Yeah. And Shakespeare is not easy to tweak because he had a wife and two, two surviving kids in Stratford. So how you throw him into a love story that ends without the stain of adultery was a nightmare for Tom Stoppard. And yeah. he just throw onto that uh, cross-dressing and same-sex desire. And it takes a Tom Stoppard to cut that Gordian knot, oppose Harvey Weinstein's interventions for the most part, and give us that delightful movie. But underneath the veneer of that film is, as I try to describe, um, a lot of conflict, a lot of division, a lot of anger. Well, there's uh, there's also you're you're throwing that out to a large, fairly large community of Shakespearean purists who are going to be from the very opening credits. They're going to look for stuff. And guess who? Of course. Guess who? There's one thing that bothers me about the movie, and the only thing, and I love Tell everything me. else, uh, the the joke, and it's a fabulous joke about I think it's uh, Romeo and uh, the, the Juliet, the pirate's daughter. Is that this, they're working with a, a title like that? And now I know from my studies that uh, Arthur Brooks uh, brought out uh, Romeo and Julie, uh, Juliet, and that that story appeared in Win uh, William Painter's Palace of Pleasure with multiple editions afterwards, thirty years before. She Shakespeare was there. It could not have been anything but Juliet from a fine Italian family. Right? And not Ethel, the pirate's daughter. And Ethel, that was it, not Juliet. Ethel, the pirate's daughter, which is so funny, but it just couldn't have been that. And it sort of promoted the myth of Shakespeare's uh, creative consciousness and originality, which I, I push back against whenever I do whatever little article I do, because I find the creative energy in Shakespeare is in the ad adaptation, in the brilliant adaptation, and the writing of speeches using that uh, fodder that, uh, just like we would say with um, um, uh, Coppola and The Godfather, you know, taking that right. source material and making it do something in another medium. Uh, I'm, I'm, that's, I'm thrilled about that probably more than somebody just dreaming up uh, uh, things. And Shakespeare did dream up things, but, uh, but very, very faithful to certain sources that he knew would have popular appeal uh, in that time. Uh, and it's just a small thing. Well, one of the pleasures you have ahead for your, uh, uh, this holiday season is um, Joel Cohen of the Cohen Brothers has uh, Phil Macbeth in black and white. And I've had a chance to see it at the New York Film Festival. Oh, no, you have. I have. And I have a piece out this week in um, the New York Review of Books on, on it. And it's very brilliant. It's extraordinarily brilliant. And Shakespeareans are going to love this film. They'll probably have one or two uh, questions about it, as we always do. Yeah. But um, Den Denzel, Denzel, Denzel yeah. Washington is Macbeth. Francis McDormand is uh, Francis Macbeth, McDormand. and uh, um, powerhouse performances from from top to bottom. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think we'll be showing this to our students for or our successors for decades to come.
Oh, I'm so happy when that happens, because uh, that does give you such uh, in, in teaching. And particularly, I'm in, uh, uh, my students are very good in uh, English, but there's still a second language, and it's a second culture, and it's a second culture to native speakers. And to be able to help use films and show how directors, and in this case, one of the finest film directors, you know, ever, uh, and his brother also, uh, and writers, uh, to to be able to use that to bridge those gaps, it just it makes everything uh, click. Well, you're gonna you're gonna love it, and uh, a lot of it is steeped in Kurosawa's Throne of Blood. So you can show the two films together. That'll be exciting. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, I just wanted to comment a bit on the on the Trump part uh, and this uh, this <laughs> proclivity at the Delacourt, and I think there. Was, I think it was also at the Delacorte where Obama was Julius Caesar earlier. And it was at the same theater or it might've been another. It was a different theater. The, there was an, uh, a production of Julius Caesar in which an Obama lookalike was, was uh, assassinated in New York City yeah. uh, about uh, six months before uh, the production that I advised in which a Trump lookalike was assassinated uh, in Central Park to the chagrin and growing anger of those on the cultural right who uh, attacked the stage. Yeah, they disrupt performances, yeah, yeah. In, in a scary way. And uh, I'll let uh, our viewers read about that in your book, uh, but it's, uh, it's scary, scary stuff. But you made the point in the book that, you know, they're, they're not taking the whole picture of Julius Caesar. You know, to the scene. No, you know. Uh, now, I don't think either uh, Obama or Trump exactly crossed the Rubicon and and did. You know, if if we're going to be historically or I agree. follow a, um, who, who is it? Uh, uh, Plutarch or Norse version of Plutarch, uh, but uh, still, all right. We're adapting it for a modern audience. We do have two iconic figures who are iconic in ways that George uh, Bush and Bill Clinton even are not. Uh, it would not work. Uh, Obama coming. I agree. In, I agree. That's a and, very good point. Uh, and so there, there would be immediate jealousy. But what they missed is, of course, the fact of how uh, swiftly Brutus and his gang were punished for what they did. Yeah, it didn't. Uh, it, it didn't it work tolerant. out. Yeah, it didn't um, work out. <laughs> uh, but when I saw the events uh, uh, of last January on the attack on the Capitol, I, I really felt um, that what I had witnessed at the Delacorte Theater at a production of Julius Caesar was a dress rehearsal. Yeah, yeah, surely was. But you did connect that with Astor Place and with how quickly people can get stirred up uh, for, for whatever reasons and how quickly theater still does that. It does, it's true. Uh, and, the, and the brand, I guess, the brand name Shakespeare, that can still get that... Um, uh, the that, blood flowing, the blood flowing and the right wing media, you know, going in now, of course, Shakespeare now, I think might be because of the years of being taught in school associated with uh, nerds, eggheads, intellectuals, um, uh, left coast, right, you know, uh, blue states, coastal blue states, uh, elites, that sort of thing. And that's that's very strong. Uh, uh, in right now, and I think that it may have been very strong in the mid 19th century. That kind of thinking, uh, and I don't know where it comes from. I, I really no, nor I. I. Yeah, you turn to this American theme. Now, your your book, which is a, an anthology, is a series of cutouts from various uh, influential people uh, talking about Shakespeare in America. And uh, and that one interesting uh, in itself and uh, wonderful reading for people who are historians or Shakespeareans also. You've been on this uh, American thing for a bit here. And what uh, was it always there? Did you turn to it? Is it no, I'm, I mean, I'm I was probably sitting in the row behind you in, in London from matinee and evening performances. You know, my 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 connection with Shakespeare has always been with British theater, London yeah. theater, yeah. Royal Shakespeare Company theater in, in Stratford-upon-Avon. And it, it's truly only been in the last half dozen years that I've, I've turned to an American focus. Uh, um, I, I, I love Britain, I love 
theater in Britain. Uh, and that when I was, I, I never studied Shakespeare at university. I, I had had a terrible experience with Shakespeare in high school and swore no one would ever force me to study Shakespeare again. And that's a not uncommon experience, but it it's helped me reach readers who I know um, hated Shakespeare, even if they won't admit it. And when I was in my late teens, I traveled uh, to Europe quite a bit, first with my big brother, then alone. And we ended up in London and for, as you remember, for, you know, just a dollar or two, you could get a student ticket to see a play and a matinee. And all of a sudden you were seeing six or seven Shakespeare productions in a week. And I came back every year through my late teens and early twenties. And by then I'd seen, I don't know, a couple of hundred, maybe 250 productions only Shakespeare. People would offer me tickets to Nicholas Nickleby, which would be a huge hit. I'd say, no, I'm going to see my fourth comedy of error, you know, comedy <laughs> of errors uh, uh, instead. Yeah. And um, but those that's a very formative time in one's life, as, as you know, as well. Yeah. And those productions are tattooed in my head. And yeah. uh, that was my Shakespeare education. And I, I must have spent a lot of time napping during American history in high school because I don't remember a damn thing. <laughs> so I've had to re-educate myself as, as an American citizen. Uh, and my next book is also going to be on, on an American uh, subject with some Shakespeare in there as well. Yeah. Oh, there's so many, there's so many stories we could tell. We don't have time. One prominent one is that the old Vic, when I was there, the old Vic was about to go under and it's on the wrong side of the river. Now it's kind of the right side of the river because that's right. all, uh, uh, rejuvenated. And for two pounds, I had front row seats to a production of Chekhov's Ivanov. And wow. I, I do go off Shakespeare, particularly if it's Chekhov or somebody like Beckett or, you know, these great uh, playwrights. And Ivanov is not a mainstream play. It's not, you know, the cherry orchard. But I thought, you know, uh, my, my professor said, this is a, a early, this is a portrayal of a, what was called then manic depressiveness, which we'd call now bipolar. And I got there and I watched and the lead actor in that play just killed it. It was the best thing I think I've ever wow. seen. You know, it's just, you know, one of those things that you go, well, God, and I'm front row. And uh, his name was Derek Jacoby. Wow. And this was before. Wow. I, yeah, this was before I Claudius or any of the recognition. He was in this off off play. And I went to the pub after it was with my friend and uh, here he walked in. And, you know, of course, I walked up and I said, uh, Mr. Jacoby, I really enjoyed your performance. And he said, someone was in the audience. <laughs> but, you are uh, very lucky. But, yeah. we, we, you know, we, we, we are of an age. Um, but it was an age where you could see before the age of uh, Netflix, where stars couldn't afford to do theater work. Their agents wouldn't let them. Yeah. Uh, we had a chance to see extraordinary the best actors in the world uh uh perform in these plays and for you and for me obviously for both of us it was a transformative experience yeah it, yeah it was it did everything it was almost a tragic transformation for me but i managed to struggle through and get into a, a profession and a good job a lot of people have trouble in the profession but uh because of that and this is the uh, next uh, topic that uh, I, I find that my younger colleagues in the profession are very cautious now about what they say and do in papers, and they have to be, necessarily, they have to be, they have to fit into journals, they have to get their promotions, they're lucky to be where they are, and they and anything uh, could, dis could destroy them, you know, uh, a colleague who doesn't like them, kind of blackballs them in a tenure decision or a promotion decision and that kind of thing. We won't go into that, but it can be very, very uh, ugly and mean. Uh, not so much here in Japan, right? It, but the, uh, uh, I would say in Japan, you would see something like that coming a long way off, whereas in the States, you might not even know somebody, yeah. there might be an Iago right there who is smiling in your face and, you know, eh. So people are very cautious and you are not cautious. There's not, I've never seen a bit of caution. Now you started out with Johnson and rival playwrights. So you're always talking about conflict there, but getting into uh, anti-Semitism, 
um, and in two in two books uh, because there's the Germantown who I won't dare try to pronounce. Obermergau. Yes, that history there, and then the. Um, Contested will, the authorship question. Authorship question, my goodness, you know, you said, just stand on stage middle with a big bullseye and say, here I am, because there are all those guys, those people out there, and they're absolutely relentless, you know, there's nothing, trolls are nothing new to us, uh, there's nothing new to you, they've been there. I'm their worst nightmare. You, I'm good, <laughs> good. After uh, I published um, Contested Will, the, on the authorship question, I got a letter on Supreme Court stationery addressed to me at Columbia. And I thought, I didn't know they had jury duty for the Supreme Court. I can't, I can't do that. And I tore the envelope open and it was um, from a uh, Supreme Court justice recently retired, Justice Stevens, who I admire this side idolatry. And he noted that Shakespeare's signatures, the six signatures are all wobbly, suggesting to him that Shakespeare was illiterate and didn't write the plays. And being combative Brooklyn guy that you obviously recognize in my work, I wrote back saying, dear Justice Stevens, I admire your extraordinary time on the Supreme Court. I noticed that your secretary typed this letter and also signed it for you extraordinary that you've gotten this far as an illiterate. And uh, yeah, it was kind of brazen to to do that. Uh, just like well, I'm sure he loved it. He must have loved that. That's he wrote back the next day and we corresponded for six months until I ghosted him because the position he was advocating was an Oxfordian position that the Earl of Oxford, who was fiercely in, in, in the minds of his supporters, anti-democratic, was the true author of Shakespeare's plays. And I said to Justice Stevens, or I wrote to him, and my correspondence with him is now at the Folger Library. I've donated it so others can mine this. But I just said, look, you, you can't celebrate American democracy and advocate a Shakespeare written by a deeply anti-democratic individual. It doesn't work. You can't do both. And he said, yes, I can. And I said, then this conversation's over. How Case about that? closed. How about that? That's how it ended. Yeah, it kind of in it a- did. Yeah. It did, he was a lovely man, but uh, you know, for me being tendered means um, an obligation to, I, nobody in his right mind or her right mind would spend five years researching as uninteresting a question as who wrote Shakespeare. We, we know who wrote Shakespeare. Yeah. We've seen the archival evidence. I, I've held it in my hands. But for me, that book was also about the rise of conspiracy thinking in America. Yeah. And uh, anybody who reads the newspaper or goes online knows just how viral that has become in the decades since I wrote that book. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it irritates me. I think, you know, okay, let's say I'm going to be uh, anti uh, Hemingway. I'm just going to say Hemingway did not write anything Hemingway wrote. Said, yes, he did. Look, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, we knew he wasn't. Did you see him write? Did you actually see him write? And did you stand there in the room when he finished a farewell to arms and watch him take it to the publisher and then, then print it? You know, it, it's that ridiculous that uh, you and and yet they are out there and I don't know what drives it, except it brings a lot of attention to the people who take a stance like that. And also there is a strong feeling that you had to go to Oxford or Cambridge to write poetry like that. And we did countless examples of people who uh, don't have education, so that, you know, and uh, as you were saying, I, I wasn't uh, the best uh, student in high school. And uh, I, I managed at some point to get through and get into a pretty, you know, good programs or whatever. But uh, the, all of us have our histories of having to, I mean, you could say, listen, there's no way that uh, James Shapiro wrote these books. He was born in Brooklyn to this, you know, in this background. Uh, and there's no you know, way that this uh, a, a boy from uh, the country, a country crossroads could ever, you know, have anything worthwhile to say about Shakespeare. You know, that's a class thing. But it, 
you, you don't go to those schools. They don't sit you down and say, here's how to write a sonnet. That's the last thing they do. In fact, I'm not James Shapiro. I'll fess up right now. James Shapiro is a reclusive <laughs> scholar, and he hires me to do these. I've read his books, and he's hired me to do these uh, interviews so that he can focus on his scholarship. But I'm happy to continue to answer your questions. Yeah. Well, you said in one of your, uh, I saw on YouTube that you didn't take Shakespeare in graduate school. That That's you were in true. A comparative literature program. And I found that amazing. I was definitely not going to study Shakespeare formally. And, and in fact, um, it, it allowed me to follow my own path. Uh, I also understood that if you hook yourself to a star professor, you end up in a lot of ways like a small tree overshadowed by a larger one that blocks out the light. And I couldn't risk that. I understood myself uh, well enough to know that it would take a long time to shed that influence for, for better and for worse. Yeah, that's so interesting that, yeah, uh, and you took it up uh, after, after graduate school to, to go into this. And uh, that's, that explains what I find to be some of the uh, uniqueness in your research methods. Uh, because when you do get into even your other, uh, the two books, The Year of Lear, uh, in the 1599, I can't imagine in the training I had, it would not have been easy to pass through the gauntlet of uh, getting a dissertation approved, doing that type of thing. They, they would want me to do something, uh, uh, I, I don't want to, you know, something else, but something that basically modeled the professors I studied under, and, uh, and also very careful very careful, meticulous, uh, maybe textual, bibliographical scholarship, uh, maybe adopting some approved critics, whether it's Lacan or Foucault or something of that nature. And, uh, and I saw that refreshing thing that you said, let's just go look at the year and the records are there for all of us. And we are, after all, trained in historical research. So let's just put it together and see what happens. We've been talking about the past the whole time and you have the future in your subtitle. So let's talk about the future. What's the future for Shakespeare in America for, uh, for us? Well, one of the things that I do is work with a lot of really first rate theater companies. It's, it's a blessing and it keeps me uh, open to where things are going. And uh, one of the productions that I'm, I'm talking with right now is a production of The Merchant of Venice mm -hmm. with an African-American Shylock, John Douglas Thompson, one of the top Shakespeare actors in America. And it goes back to Ira Aldridge, who was a great Othello. We all know that. Yeah. But he was also a spectacular Shylock. So here we have two centuries later, an African-American who in the New York theater is going to be playing Shylock. How that's going to land with Jewish groups and Black groups, I have no idea. But you know that I love conflict. Uh, and that's what this is about. I'm working with a Native American playwright who will be doing a Shakespeare production uh, in the years to come, I'm working with Latinx directors. I'm working right now on a production of the Comedy of Errors that's going into prison that is going to have some Spanish in it as well. So what I'm describing is a way in which a multicultural or pluralistic Shakespeare or Shakespeare that is not simply white and Anglo-Saxon is now penetrating into the theater culture and not simply in terms of scholarship on race, although Ayanna Thompson and others are, 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 are leading that. But um, that is one of the futures for Shakespeare in America. That is to say, what does it mean to have Denzel Washington, one of our great, great, great actors playing Macbeth? When Orson Welles and others have made films of Macbeth that didn't have a single black actor, and Joel Cohen has has several in among the leads and also among the lesser roles. So yeah. it's a changing world we're living in. And Shakespeare is both reflecting those changes and helping to make them happen. Yeah. If not for Joe Papp at the public theater in the 1950s and 60s, giving a chance to every leading 
uh, Latinx and black actor of the day, we wouldn't have the, the Denzel Washingtons uh, in, in, in the movie theaters today. Yeah. So I think that's one of the things that's happening. The other thing that I'm turning to is um, the federal theater project of the late 1930s, about which I knew very little, in which for a remarkable four years, there were hundreds, even thousands of productions around the United States paid for by the federal government under FDR and the New Deal. And until uh, Philistines in Congress shut off the funding for this, we were on the verge of a national theater that would have made theater part of daily life in small communities and large. You, you could pay a nickel and see a play, much as we saw plays as students in, in London. And I guess having seen this plan take root in 1936 and then being uprooted in 1939 is for me one of the saddest chapters in my nation's history. And um, I'm spending the next few years delving into that and what happened then. Yeah. Yeah. Funding uh, the, the, the Philistines, it just doesn't seem to be any way to cross that bridge and get them to understand that you get a lot of bang for your buck. It doesn't cost that much. And when it's successful, it brings, it makes people money. If that's what you're worried about money, it brings in. Yeah. But they were uh, afraid and, of too educated, a populace too uh, open minded, a populace. That's that was what threatened the Philistines. Really, too educated a populace like that's on the horizon. But the, <laughs> well, I want to. You're going to Ireland. You're you're. On, is that okay to talk about? You're on. Sure, yeah. sure. And you're going to Ireland, and I'm very interested. Why Ireland? I think I have some idea, maybe. But uh, uh, what a fabulous thing you have right in your near future, right after Christmas, right? Uh, yeah. Well, I've had to postpone it by a month because of um, uh, COVID uh, and restrictions in Ireland, but uh, I've just rebooked successfully. And um, I'm married to an extraordinary writer uh, who has Irish grandparents, all four. And one of her grandparents, uh, her grandfather on her father's side, uh, fought in the Irish Revolution. And uh, she has uh, accompanied me on many research trips. And now I'm accompanying her on her research trip. I'm a really good research assistant and driver. And uh, um, I have many Irish friends. Colm Tobin is my colleague at Columbia, Paul Muldoon, Fintan O'Toole. And um, uh, I feel a real affinity as a Brooklyn Jew with the Irish for some weird reason. I think they're confrontational as well after all the years battling the English. And I know I never would have written about Ireland in, in 1599 uh, without having a, a strong interest in Irish uh, culture and literature and and music as well. Yeah. So uh, I'm on sabbatical this spring and um, happy to to get out of uh, uh, plague ridden New York. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the Irish is uh, it, here and there objects of uh, genocidal rampages. I think there'd be some, uh, yeah, uh, cross identity there. But in terms of drama and theater. Uh, the history, unmatched, uh, unmatched, and yeah. uh, the, just the Abbey Theater, just to take a look and you know, and into Yates and that whole uh, period. And uh, I just uh, sat on a dissertation as a second reader or whatnot, and the student was working on uh, the arts and crafts movements in uh, the 19th century in Ireland, and it's just fascinating stuff and how it connected with Yates and with drama. There's a connection there, and of course Beckett, and then. Um, uh, oh, Casey. I, I, remember, saying, I mean, they're just yeah, extraordinary. They're saying, yeah. and many oh, contemporary like, Irish playwrights as well. So, yeah. uh, no, I, I spend uh, every every night that I can in the theater in Ireland. And uh, uh, the last time I was over there, I saw a production of uh, Midsummer Night's Dream yeah. that had the same cast as the production of Midsummer Night's Dream in 1977. 
And now they were all in their 70s and 80s. And it was um, brilliant. Resituated in an old age home. Brilliant. And it was quite brilliant. And, you know, all those Randy, slightly Alzheimer's patients, it yeah. was brilliant. Then it shows you these plays just keep on giving. They keep on they really showing do. new sides. They really do. That is, is endless. Um, well, Jim, I have kept you through supper time. Uh, and I've kept you through breakfast. So we're equal yeah, here. Yeah, I, I might. Yeah, I might have. Well, I think I'll have another cup of coffee after we finish because I do have a class today and I, I'll uh, uh, be doing that pretty soon. Uh, I um uh, I, I again want to express our, our deepest appreciation and our uh, apologies. I don't know why we'd have to apologize. It's not our fault, but our apologies for not being able to to bring you over. And uh, and but at least we can do this. Uh, this uh, this was a thrill, nice. and I know uh, our paths are going to cross in person once the world is back on its feet. And I'm certain we'll just have to make it happen. And, and thank you so much, Jim, again. Well, it's been a pleasure talking. And uh, I'm sure we were in the theater at the same time and same oh, yeah. place some years back. 